shared that group as part of Island Pathways for a number of years. She did her very first Freedom of Information request uh, on Salt Spring Roads way back in 2011. And once again, she has installed. Thank you. Neighbors and friends, this is lovely. Thank you for coming out on the first day of summer. And um, the numbers that we deal with in terms of the incorporation study report, uh, for those of us who read it to the end, a lot of numbers. <laughs> so we'll get started with, um, this is a, 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 the ro a road, just the roads of Salt Spring. Um, it's from a map that I did of the whole island and I just took the, the map, the roads layer and I really view Salt Spring often as a pterodactyl. So you can see what a, a web of roads we have that really, really enmesh and define the island. A lot of roads. And uh, I like in the south end, we get the, we get the little feet out at the end, right? Little dancing feet down here. So although I did my first FO, a Freedom of Information request in 2011, it was when the governance study got underway that uh, in 2012 to 2013 that I got more serious about gathering information and certainly the Salt Spring uh, Incorporation study set me off to uh, doing further FOIs to find out. Um, uh, so that the intent of the report is to provide the community with the information needed to make an informed decision about municipal incorporation. And, uh, you know, that's kind of a motherhood statement. Of course, that's what we want it to have. I'm going to warn you with my, with my PowerPoint that ideally with a PowerPoint, I like to do them with lots of pictures and not really have the same words on the screen as what I say. But that's going to happen a lot because when you're dealing with numbers and, and uh, kind of getting into the bookkeeping, I think it helps to, to have it uh, meted out step by step so we can grasp it as we move it along. Um, the problem that I have with the incorporation study report is that everything to do with roads is incomplete, some of it's inaccurate, uh, they extrapolate to conclusions that are based on faulty premises. So I just want to make clear what's missing and to accurately present the real hard fact data and uh, just to uh, address the misleading statements that have come out of, of the numbers that need to be uh, verified, uh, give some real ones. As best I can with this, I put the information in white boxes uh, that's uh, missing, incomplete, or inaccurate in the report. So, the types of roads that we have, the incorporation study report says that MOTI data says there are 265 kilometers of public roads on Salt Spring, and I think that's a good number to go with. Um, the incorporation study committee, uh, through public pressure, very wisely uh, got for us a road condition assessment report, for which we're grateful, and McElhaney Consulting I think that they must have done kind of a GPS from on you, using Google Earth or somehow tracking the roads here. And they came up with 272 kilometers. But, you know, there's BC Hydro Road up Musgrave Way, and there's BC Parks Road that's the, the little pieces going up to uh, Ruckle Park. And they even say there may be some private roads that they put on here. So, you know, I guess I wonder from the get-go, in terms of the length of roads we have, why was the water muddy between 265 and 272? Let's just go with what MOTI uses, the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure, because they look after all of our public roads, and that's their responsibility. They know how many kilometers they deal with. So that's what I'm using. My first FOI was to get the length of Salt Spring Roads as well as their classifications. And in 2011, we had uh, 261.4 kilometers of roads. So 265, good number. Uh, typical Salt Spring Road, of course. Uh, the report says, and uh, accurate, I would expect, that 98 kilometers are paved, 100 kilometers seal coated. Seal coats uh, gravel and tar. Uh, called chip seal, surface treated, has other names, 67 kilometers of gravel. Um, I think we're pretty sure that nearly, nearly all of them are dirt. 
Gravel roads need to have a new lift of gravel put on them every few years. Uh, you know, they get graded down. I, we, I live down King Road, as a lot of you know, and it gets graded every few weeks, and they're grading it down and down and down. It hasn't seen gravel for so long, oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, anyway, that, and, and this photo just shows really nicely, uh, taken from Google Street View. Best way to travel on our roads if you can't get out and don't want to smog. <laughs> seal coated on uh, Burgoyne Bay Road, paved road, crack seal. Last population uh, census count, uh, and 265 kilometers roads divided by how many people here. Uh, the incorporation study report uses uh, meters per capita, so I put it, uh, that's how we'll use it here. Um, I pulled together this graph, one of my earlier, uh, no, I didn't have to do an FOI for this. Um, at the Union of BC Munis Municipalities, they have uh, civic information, and year by year they tell you the number of kilometers of roads that nearly every community in BC has. So you think, well, that's really easy. I'll just grab those numbers and make a graph. Uh-uh, it doesn't work that way. Roads are measured either as uh, lane kilometers or kilometers of two-lane roads. So there are two lane kilometers in one kilometer of two-lane roads. So the road out here, you go a kilometer on it, that's two lane kilometers, or one kilometer, right? So uh, bless these communities when they report what they've got, they don't stick to one or the other. <laughs> so some of them are one, some are the other, and which is which? So I had to go into every one of these um, civic uh, uh, local government sites and find out what they said there. And if they weren't clear there, I would go into um, public uh, tendering, con contract tendering, that they any way that I could snoop and find out and phone and whatever it took to make sure that when I pulled this graph together, it is kilometers of two lane roads. So they all match, they're all comparable. So you can't say, well, Salt Spring just sticks up way high like that because you're, you're measuring it as lane kilometers. Uh-uh, that sticks up that high, it really does. Uh, I put, from, from the left you've got, uh, actually it ranges from 8,000 approximately residents on the right, and Comox on the left is about 14,000 residents, and then I put Bowen out on the side because they're not comparable in terms of, of, of population. Uh, these figures, uh, 2011 census data, that was the last year that I could really get a really solid number, but you know, the, the kilometers of roads really don't go up that much from year to year or even decade to decade of, of public roads. Um, so they have a, close to 11 meters per capita. So Bowen has two times the average, Salt Spring has 2.3 times the average. Now an interesting figure that I was questioned on is why I threw in the city of Victoria with 60, 260 kilometers of two lane roads compared to ours. Well honestly, I would never have thought to put that one in. It was urban systems at the road condition assessment report open house that gave that one. And the interesting thing about that number, as I say here, that roadworks have kind of similar costs. Some roads cost more than others, but in a sense, kilometer for kilometer, they just have some baseline costs, right? The pavement ages at a certain rate and chip seal rate ages at a certain rate. And it's just the way it works. And that's the, for the life cycle planning. Uh, as I said, we're all really grateful, actually, that the, we got the road condition assessment report. And a really useful graph that they give, and I'm sure that we've all seen, because it's really interesting, is the life of pavement and how long a paved road will last. And this is a road that hasn't been, it isn't looked after. And it's dependent on a lot of things, like the, the base of the road and what kind of traffic is going over it. And, what kind of water issues it might have under it and across it and storming down on it. But in general, the good thing that you see from here is when you get to 12% of life, which is way down, obviously, in the bottom right of the graph, it's going to cost you four to five times more than if you do some rehab sooner. And I, I threw in this other graph because the graph in the, in the incorporation study report doesn't give years along the x-axis. It does have age as percent, that is correct, but we need to know some years. Now, this is a graph from a seal coating company, so, you know, a grain of salt or two. 
But uh, at the bottom axis, if a road, paved road, average paved road, isn't looked after, after 14, 15 years, it can be at the end of its life. It might take 25 years to get to that. But the important thing here is that you do minor report pairs, you do your seal coating, you do some uh, crack sealing with the product they're selling, of course. Uh, you'll see that uh, pavement can last 20 to 25 years. And with good care, I mean, and, and a good sub base and, and traffic not tearing it up too much, heavy traffic, you know, heavy trucks, uh, yeah, it can go kind of indefinitely. But a lot of Salt Spring roads, we all know, because we travel on them all the time, they're, they're getting into the 15, 20 year kind of end of their, end of their lives. I then go into Bowen Island Road costs, and this is a white box because there's not really anything about Bowen Island Roads in the incorporation study report, and that's really unfortunate because they really work hard to do apples to apples comparisons, and you know, Bowen's the only other municipality in the Islands Trust, and the island's pretty similar in a lot of ways to Salt Spring, and the roads are pretty similar, the state of the roads, uh, the uh, standard that they keep them to, you know, that could be on Salt Spring as well as, as Bowen. We know that. A lot of us have been there. Um, Salt Spring has about three times the population of Bowen Island. So we're going to have about three times the traffic, depending on the road. But certainly on the main roads, we're going to have three times the traffic. And that includes a lot of large trucks. And that means that we have to have a, a, a better sub-base, I guess, and better pavement. Because you think, well, you know, if a car weighs 2,000 pounds, we'll do pounds, whatever call it kilograms if you want, and the big truck weighs 20 times more, that's going to do 20 times more damage, right? Oh no. <laughs> this, is, this is where we get to go from simple arithmetic and, and multiplying into exponents. And if you've got an 80,000 uh, pounds on, on uh, this five axle tractor trailer, that's going to be the equivalent of close to 10,000 automobiles. And the problem is, exponentially it's to the fourth power. So an 18-wheeler can cause 150,000 times more damage than a car. So, because I, I live with a, a resident expert on this and we enjoy talking about this stuff. He was explaining recently about how pavement works. So if you've got asphalt pavement that's yay thick, cars on the top, they just scratch it. They just wear out the paint. That's what we do, right? All of us with cars. Big trucks bend it this way. So when they depress it, the gravel comes up and makes cracks, right? They're going to do a crack seal because you don't want water getting in there. It's going to get, it'll be exacerbated. It'll, get, it'll keep getting worse, but at the very least, you can try to protect it. So uh, we need pretty robust roads, certainly like the Fulford Ganges. And it's 70, wow, 15 years ago or so, there were 70 grocery trucks coming here every week to keep us fed. And all of the... Uh, Oh, I mean, look at the trucks coming off the ferries. Heavy stuff of every sort. So, uh, Bowen, 75 kilometers of two-lane roads. They're all paved or seal-coated, which is good because gravel, <coughs> gravel and dirt roads actually cost more than paved or seal-coated roads to look after. And uh, 75 kilometers is what I've run with because that's what they said in, uh, in 2014. In 2015, they said that they had 70.1 kilometers, and recently they've said they have 67.5. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> but in using the larger number, it gives the more conservative cost per kilometer, which is what we're going to get to. So previous to 2015, Bowen spent you know $645,000. This is all in six, uh, 2016 constant dollars. And you have to do that, and it's done very nicely in the incorporation study report, uh, because when you get into future costs, we can only tell the prices that we know now. Uh, you, you can't get into guessing what inflation might be. And in order to calculate the 2016 constant dollars from previous numbers, uh, Statistics Canada has a BC inflation calculator, so online, easy to use. So this is what they spent year by year and you get the average and then you put it into $2016. And that's how you come up with nearly $645,000 per year. Uh, Bowen incorporated in 1999 
And five years, they had a five-year transition uh, funding and help from the BC government. In 2004, they're going on their own, right? Looking after all of this stuff. So it was then that they established a roads maintenance and renewal reserve fund. I'll just call it the roads reserve fund. And uh, to do all kinds of maintenance, renewal, construction, emergency, what, whatever. Just to all the extra costs beyond the usual maintenance. And uh, you need that because roads wear out. There's also, um, you know, we have issues. There, there are emergencies. Stuff happens. Culverts collapse. Roads go into the sea. Whatever. Uh, so, from the, the previous years that we've just covered, they tr Bowen transfers money into its road maintenance and renewal res reserve fund, and then it pulls money out. So, in those years here, you can see that they they took out quite a lot, actually. They're just leaving a certain percentage or amount average each year for a rainy day fund that accrues. And, you know, the, the road reserve fund is tax money. They, they take the general maintenance funding out of one of the taxpayers' pockets, and they take the road reserve fund money out of the other tax, other pocket. But it's the same taxpayer, right? So you can't say, oh, well, they get that money from someplace else. No, it, it comes from taxes, local taxes. So in total, what you get that they spent up till 2015 was about $14,700 per kilometer to keep the roads in their present state. They're, as far as I know, uh, husband Don and I visited in late 2015. We went with uh, Peter Lamb and Jean Galwicks. Uh, they stayed for three nights on Bowen. We stayed for two nights. We talked to all the civic officials that we could, the employees, to residents, whatever. So we were all over their roads as, as well. And uh, so we know from talking to them, as, well, as far as we know and to date, they don't have any, you know, big upgrades planned or a whole bunch more roads that they're going to build. So about 40% of their budget is, is in the roads reserve fund. And then we're going to get into the future. I need to get the drink. Um, so this is what they're planning for the, essentially the next five years, $16,300 per kilometer. So just, you know, stuck, stick that number in your bonnet. Same ratio. They, they need a roads reserve fund. And uh, in these coming years, they're going to put 460,000, transfer from its road maintenance reserve fund. So they're putting 500,000 in and they're going to leave 40,000 each year. So it can add up, so if they have any big jobs, they'll have a little bit extra money. So let's get to Salt Spring Road costs. And uh, should we incorporate? This is what the incorporation study committee says that we're going to do. It says, you know, if we incorporate, we're going to have a five-year transition period, and we're going to be kind of nicely looked after. The BC government's going to um, pony up and, and look after our, our roads, and they're going to do some uh, improvements on our roads. but. So the incorporation study report then goes beyond that. So in the years 2023 to 2028, so we're in year five to 10 of after we've incorporated. And uh, they're saying that our routine maintenance for 265 kilometers of roads will be $1,360,000. And uh, a little, little sort of uh, Tory footnotes. And in 2013, one of my FOIs was to uh, find out, no, I didn't have to FOI that. Oh, that was so amazing. I phoned at MOTI office. And after several phone calls and lots of emails, they, they gave me the information. It was lovely. Uh, the office that looks after the road maintenance contractors uh, estimated that Main Road, who, who is the contractor here, um, it has the South Coast contract, and they get a big lump sum, but, but the, uh, the best estimate that they could give, ballpark figure, was about 1.4 million of the, of, the, of the overall sum goes to Salt Spring Roads. 2013, you put that in 2016 dollars, it's 1.5 million. Uh, and that's, I've uh, just explained where that came from. Uh, and then uh, the incorporation study report is saying that, you know, five to ten years hence, all other road works are going to be about $500,000 a year. Uh, under $2,000 $2, per, per kilometer. So there, there we have our total. And uh, they're saying that rehabilitation, reconstructions, emergency legal, all those other costs are a little bit more than a quarter. 
it's not the 40% that, that Bowen has for extraneous things. It's going to be about a quarter. So uh, I find this all kind of interesting because in, in 2003, MOTI reported what they spent on an average, in an average year on an average kilometer of these two lane roads in BC. It was about 8,700. That's not winter. Winter was more than double that. It was a different number. And that is a report that uh, Transport Canada came out with in 2006. So it's kind of interesting, 2003 numbers, 87, you know, 8,700, put that in 2016 dollars, you know, you're getting up there. It's, no, it's not 7,000 per kilometer. So let's talk about Salt Spring Roads beyond the regular maintenance. Um, we all know MO, MO, MOTI looks after all of our public roads and Main Road has been looking after our roads since 2004. So, it's saying, the incorporation study report saying that from about 2000 to the mid 2000s, the average capital spending was approximately $500,000 a year. And five to 10 years into incorporation, that's going to be exactly the same. But then the incorporation study report goes on to say that uh, MOTI spending levels have declined significantly. And, uh, but they're at the highest level, 2011 to 2012, they spent a little over $2 million on our roads. But in general, that's been declining, and that was an anomaly. Well, first of all, where did they get those numbers? Me. <laughs> Only me. They don't give any source or date for, this, for whatever numbers they give here. Um, at an open house for the road condition assessment report, Urban Systems said that a private citizen had supplied some numbers, and they had cross-referenced them. And uh, I was standing right in front of them. And I thought, oh, well, there's, there's some truth to that. It's just... Uh, this is a table that I made. You know, I sent all the information on to the incorporation study committee, and you know, they, I, I sent on all these, these uh, big, heavy documents. You know, 60 pages for this, 131 pages for that. But I also distilled it down for them. So there's one point where they got a 14-page distillation, and then I further distilled it into this table. I wouldn't just send them the short form because I thought Urban Systems would want to go back through the data and, and go through it the same as I did and make sure that it was correct. And thanks to, uh, to resident expert Don, he went through the numbers as well. So they've been, I hope, verified in a, in a number of really great ways. So there's some holes here, right? There's a little bit of stuff that's hard to figure out because the first batch of, the first FOI I did, I was quite naive and I just asked them for everything they had on Salt Spring Road Works from 2000 to 2013, 2014, 2015, whatever, whatever year I sent that one in. And what I got back was a wimpy little table that had Salt Spring mixed in with Pender Island and Oyster Bay. So I can only estimate there that we got about half of that money. I don't know. That, that's fair, right? And then for Oyster Bay, I estimated there was a reason in that number why it came back, why I put the number that I did. So uh, the holes, 2009-2010, um, couldn't get a thing. So I had to start doing subsequent FOIs that were much more targeted in terms of dates and, and, and times and, and even places. I had to tell them where to look. Um, like the Alders Road replacement, for example, I would never have gotten that if I didn't know that there was a culvert replacement at Alders Road. And it's kind of an interesting surprise to see that it came out at close to $600,000, you know. It was a kind of an extensive culvert, so it, it's understandable, but it's not the only culvert that, that could cost that much on island when it has to be replaced. I couldn't get anything on the North Beach washout, North Beach Road or Walker's Hook Road. I twice asked them to get financial numbers, couldn't. Um, so, I was just saying, uh, what's, what's missing is significant here. And just because it's missing doesn't mean that there was no money spent. So, uh, this comes to an average, just, just the numbers I could get, comes to $641,000. So, how does that square up with $500,000 per year? This is MOTI's own numbers. You know, hello. <laughs> Strange. 
about half of the requests that I made, of course, didn't get any financial data. They actually redacted it, and they don't block it out with black lines. They, it's just white. Where there's supposed to be financial figures, it's just white. Um, so I have estimated some of the missing numbers. The Walker's Hook Road washout, at least $500,000. We, we don't know. Um, Fulford Road. Oh, and this master plan upgrade was a study that McElhaney Engineering did of Fulford Hill to see what it would cost to upgrade it to minimal standard for minimal price. And they were paid at least $100,000 to do that study. It's quite an intricate engineering study, uh, really uh, some uh, fine, finely drafted drawings with it. Uh, North Beach Road washout, $100,000. That's a real low ball. But anyway, it gives us some more numbers to work with. But then Urban Systems at the final open house said something interesting, which is something that's actually quite well known, is that MOTI does a lot of administrative engineering, su construction supervision. It does a lot of work that's, it, it's not only information that's missing, but I can't FOI it because they don't keep track of their timesheets that way. We will never know what the cost of that engineering in particular or the supervision expertise would be, but Urban Systems said that adding 30% was uh, very reasonable and, and it's probably conservative. But it's good to go with conservative numbers because it, it, it really gives us a, a, a good bottom line that, that shouldn't have anyone saying, yeah, well, you're, you're, you're trumping up your case. So now we're getting up the average for 14 years is over $900,000 a year in 2016 dollars. So again, how does that square up with 500000 uh, It's just odd to me. And a thing that was really odd to me was that Urban Systems knew about this stuff. I was giving them this information. I went to two open houses before the final report came out where I asked them about this and I wanted to know. And uh, they just kept standing by what, what they said. So now we're coming, when you add all this stuff up, you're coming to about $8,700 per kilometer to do the basic maintenance and, and some other work beyond maintenance just to keep our roads at the state that they're at. So the nice thing about this graph is the first one on the left is, you know, about one quarter of the costs are costs above the main roads maintenance contract. And now at least we're getting up to about a third. We're not up to 40% yet for those extra costs, but it's getting more realistic. Um, at the road condition assessment report and via an email, uh, Urban Systems said that uh, the MOTI data that they used, the $500,000, uh, was complete and trustworthy. Well, A, they didn't use my numbers, and B, I know they're not complete, and you can trust them as far as, you, as what you've got, but there's stuff you don't got. So on they go with the half million dollars. So is it 500,000, 640,000 at least, plus the 30%, 900,000? It's kind of all over. And I said, sometimes with these numbers, I feel a little bit like Alice in Wonderland. There's a number coming out of the sky here and another one out of a pocket here, and you're going, <laughs> and they're floating around. We'll just grab, grab and hang on. Uh, so we pay about uh, 1.95 million per year in the provincial rural property taxes. Um, and the incorporation study report says that nearly all of this goes to roads, but there's no supporting data. I don't know where they, why they would say that, because there's numerous island services. And for example, when the BC government purchased Grace Islet for nearly five and a half million dollars, that came out of our rural property taxes. Uh, and you know, throughout the incorporation study report, at least eight times I've counted, and I found more today as I was going through the back pages, they say that Salt Spring pays more rural property tax than it gets back in roadworks. They say this again and again and again. It's in the executive summary. It seems to be on every tenth page. It just goes on and on. And uh, the truth is the minimal cost, the, the minimal is, for roadworks that we get out of MOTI is 2.3 million. So we pay less rural property tax than we get back in roadworks, and we get Grace Islet bought for us. Big bonus. 
So the incorporation study report says that we're going to be paying $90,000 less per year municipal road taxes for all road work costs at the present service level. Different universe, it's different arithmetic than most of us do. But we'll pay at the very least $300,000 more per year. Maybe $640,000, maybe $900,000. So a roads maintenance and renewal fund, um, there will be a five year transition period, as everyone knows, a municipal property tax will replace it. So the, the thing is with the, what is going to be spent on roads as a municipality, I mean, they could spend nothing. They could spend 1,860,000, they could spend 2,000, $2,300,000, you know, they, th that will be a decision for a municipal council to make. There's going to be a lot of cry for a lot of money for a lot of good things on this island. So are roads going to be front and center? Are they going to be on the back burner? Are you going to wait till disasters happen and have to be fixed? There's, there's questions here. Uh, I didn't even touch that. Boy, is it sensitive. Um, so the incorporation study report does note that uh, the roads reserve fund may well be set up by a municipal council and uh, they mention it in the sensitivity report and that gets you back to page 179 in the report, it gets you to page 202, you've all read that far into the report, right? <laughs> Just about all of you, right? It's not in the executive summary, but the, in the, it is to be fair, it's in the, it's in the sensitivity analysis. But, uh, what they mentioned, Urban Systems mentioned at the last open house for the incorporation study is uh, one of their experts stood up and said it's very likely in the future that we would have to have a roads reserve fund if we want to get some money out of the BC government or the Canadian government. That's coming on stream and Linda Galeazzi, who is the um, representative for the Minister, Ministry of Community, Sport and Cultural Development, she also backed that up at that meeting, that that is the case. So we're not going to get away with not having a road reserve fund, but it will be whatever size the, community, the council would decide. 20%, uh, $30%, $10 a year. They do say in the sensitivity analysis that it would add about $10 a year to our taxes to have a reserve fund, and that would be a general reserve fund that covers roads and everything else. So 40%, 10%, whatever. <laughs> We're going to have some big decisions to make. So we find out that uh, should incorporation incur, they mean occur, but no matter, um, an estimated five million would be given to us by the BC government to resurface approximately 13 kilometers of the first Bulford Ganges Road. They would widen it to the widen it to the 1.2 meter shoulder that we've been waiting for since 1992 and we agreed that that would be the minimal standard for a 60, 80 kilometer a road, 80 kilometer per hour road. And by the way, the Fulford Ganges Road is actually a design speed 60. But, um, so it does say in the incorporation study report that they're going to spend approximately five million dollars, an estimated five million dollars, to approximately 13 kilometers. Well, the Fulford Ganges Road is actually nearly 14 kilometers long. So are they really going to do from Ganges to the ferry terminal? They said they're going to do a piece of the road between those two, but they don't say two. So what happens if we want to do, so we got long snake of a road, it's got two ends. Well, what's at each end? Oh, we have hills. The Fulford Hill in the master plan upgrade uh, was estimated to cost $3.4 million in 2013 to bring it up to minimal standard, minimal cost, and that includes some property purchases. And it was interesting getting that number because in the 60-some page, pages that I got back, they, they whited out every financial figure they possibly could, but there was one little tiny, tiny place up in a header where they had the estimated you know, overall cost. So, you know. It becomes kind of a cat and mouse game in a way, you know, it's this sleuthing. Oh, and then Ganges Hill. I'm not going to back up. I went ahead too far. But the Ganges Hill, we know from the feasibility study that was done in 2013, April, came out then. It's going to be about two and a half million to widen it to the standard that they're saying that they will in the transition funding. 
And there are some significant property purchases and that's not in that price tag. So is it six plus million to do the two hills or five million to do the stretch in between and will five million cover the stretch in between? It would be interesting to see how that plays out should we incorporate. Yeah, here's one of our roads. Actually, this is interesting because it's Google Street View 2012. <laughs> We've had five more years on that road. Those are crack seals, also known as tar snakes, and uh, when they get wet, motorcyclists in particular really dread them, and particularly when they run parallel to the road and when they're on a corner. And it's the type of thing, in terms of accidents on that road and even possibly deaths, you know, they, they're sitting there and they're dangerous. Um, Road condition assessment report, which is also part of the incorporation study report, they uh, nicely tell us that 25 kilometers of our roads need complete reconstruction. They'd be properly engineered, they'd be standard widths. Uh, that price, 112 kilometers, uh, more than half of our paved and silk or surface treated roads, would, but they wouldn't be widened, so they'd be brought up to an uh, acceptable standard so that their lifespan would then be back to 15 to 25 years, and then some intersection concerns, etc. $35.3 million. And this is work that needs to be done immediately. So what Urban Systems has recommended that we spread that out over 15 to 30 years. Because you know a road that's getting old, it's just going to wait for 15 years until we can put a million dollars into that one. So, uh, projected totals, we've got urban systems numbers of, you know, $7,000 a kilometer more or less up to Bowen's, we've seen that already. And then uh, if you add these numbers of, um, oh, what urban systems said was, uh, I had to take a box out, they said that, yeah, it's 1.1 million, it's still there, to 2.2 million per year. So if you add 1.1 million to those above numbers, the urban systems, MOTIs, and Bowen's costs, those are the numbers that you get. So you're going from initially saying that our roads are gonna cost us under $2 million a year, and then you have $1.1 million more, it's up to nearly 3 million. Or if you do 2 million's worth in a year, it's up to 4 million. It goes up, you know, it goes up pretty fast. And this is just to, to keep, it's just a holding pattern. And it doesn't address the things that some of us find quite alarming, which is the geotechnical stuff. And that's mostly drainage issues. There's lots of drainage issues on Salt Spring. So we're going to get into some emergency costs here. And uh, we would get a one-time restructure funding if we incorporate uh, for the complete mitigation of slope stability issues on Walker's Hook Road. So they spent probably 500,000 or more on it, and then another million will do it, and that section of the road will be stable and serviceable for a good length of time. And we, I couldn't get the numbers on what that cost. I only got one email that said they'd like $250,000 extra in 2013. Extra compared to what? Uh, this is the North Beach Road Washout, 2014, again, no financial data available, but the Driftwood did note that there's several sites along the road that engineers have been monitoring as possible. So that's long, we're getting into longer stretches here, right? Bigger bills. Uh, Isabella Point Road, here we go. Um, why isn't that fixed now? That's a good, that's a good question. And uh, you know, a number of things are going on there. Um, they're not gonna repair the longer strip. And, one of the reasons, and it's probably a pretty good reason, Jan Havilar last night was nodding his head, saying, you know, when, you're, when there's a piece of a bank that's ready to slip and you're gonna be walk, work, working underneath it, it's really dangerous for your workers because something can give way, people could die. In some ways, it's easier to wait until our roads fall, and it's safer, it's not easier, and it's not cheaper, maybe, but it's certainly safer uh, for the people working on them. It may not be safer for someone driving over them as they're falling, but. Uh, Take your chances, I guess. Um, I'm not sure I'll be able to find out the cost of that contract. If, it's, uh, if uh, MOTI gets Main Road to do it uh, as a private company, I probably wouldn't be able to find out what was paid to do that fix. And don't forget that MOTI is still going to pony up about 30% of the engineering costs, so that there will be no traceable records. I would never find that out. Um, one of the holdups. Of, and, and this would be the case of any of these slumpings and falling roads on Salt Springs Riprap. 
and uh, most of the usable and, and good priced riprap is just not available in Salt Spring anymore. It's going to have to come from someplace else. It's going to have to be barged in. And whether it's the provincial government or a municipality, they're not going to say, oh, we need some riprap. We need to fix that road right away. We'll get onto it tomorrow. Sure, whatever you want to charge us, we'll pay it. They're going to fight, try to find a way to get riprap at a good price. It's expensive, particularly barged in. And the other thing with gravel, when Long Harbor Road was hot in place, um, repaved, that was all barged in gravel. Salt Springs gravel reserves are pretty well gone. There's not enough to do the, the major type of work that our roads need. So that's an increasing cost. Increasing, you know, to all communities, of course, but if MOTI pays for it, it comes out of our real property taxes and, and not out of rising municipal taxes. So what's the future work that's going to happen? Well, we've covered the North Beach and Isabella Road, etc. At least two sections on Fulford Ganges Road. And a good number of you folks here walk along the end of Fulford Harbor and, and uh, know about those slumping sections. A uh, longer one by the church and another one. There's probably a third one too, but again, I'm just, just you know, trying to be conservative in what we're showing here. There's a failing section of Morningside Road and any number of other seaside roads. You know, some of them are tagged and MOTI knows about them. Some of them, they're, you know, about to happen. Uh, drainage issues, we know about the uh, Ganges Hill, of course. There's a slumping section on Stewart Hill. As you go by, are you enjoying watching? As it, the broom is not holding it. <laughs> I'm the older. A uh, lot of culverts. You know, when the road condition assessment report was done, quite a number of people asked that the culverts be included in that report because culvert replacement can, well, it's a danger. It can be a danger on the road. So there's safety issues, but they're expensive. How many culverts do we have on island? That when they did the road condition assessment report, they drove the roads. Uh, they didn't get out and, and uh, they didn't cycle on them. They didn't walk on them. They didn't act as if they were a vulnerable road user. They, they just drove. And they were looking for their uh, road comfort. And um, it, the condition of the road was judged by how comfortably it rode and how distressed they felt when they were riding. Well, you know, a car and a bike are kind of different things, and uh, they walking too, of course. MOTI is really charged with keeping our roads safe for all road users. I mean, the, the vehicles may be king, but, but if you read their mission, mandate, vision, and values, I like to quote them back to them when I write to them, to make clear that safety is in every one of those, and it is the number one concern, and it is the trump card. So the contributing factors to these things with our decaying roads, well, of course, weather stuff. But we also get into climate change and sea level rise. Those are, of course, difficult to, to figure, but we do know that they're part of the equation. So potential costs, we can be quite sure. Fair bit. Uh, uh, private land. Uh, you know, we all know about the Bettis Road claim, and what's going on. Um, and you can say, well, that's just one little piece of Bevis and it's just one little thing on island. Well, I got looking into the CRD web map, which has a property layer, and there are at least a dozen, about a dozen more Bevis Road properties that the public road is, is going on, is either nudging against or is going into private land. So, um, I don't think that we're at much risk of any of those owners deciding to do something and putting up barricades or, or whatever. But when they do, it does become, uh, it's time consuming. Uh, at present, MOTI will solve that entirely. In fact, what, that's what they've said. Whether we incorporate or not, they're going to solve the Bettis Road problem and they're going to pay for it. And they're going to they're going to win, is essentially what they're saying. They're going to make sure that it stays public. And in a letter, uh, they do say, uh, no, it was an email from the area manager. He said that the, the Bettis Road will be, it's all, it's all on MOTI, and they will get it done. So as I was looking over the map of Salt Spring to find out where the public roads run beside and, and over public properties, I counted at least 30. I've got them in my, in my big binder. And I find this one kind of interesting with the, the one by Fulford Harbor. Um, we know that the road at the end of Fulford Harbor for sure is public, has been public for a long time. It's just a new owner could decide, heaven forbid, to play silly bugger and, you know, set up a little passport stand between the north and south that you have to go by and, <laughs> and, and, and play games with, with it because it would be called a private road, even though for sure it's going to be public. Um, 
This is an interesting piece of property, and what it tells you is that it's never been subdivided. From when it was preempted, this piece of property was preempted in the 1870s, and it's never been subdivided. So there's a whole chunk, it's pushing a kilometer of Beaver Point Road, that uh, it looks to be in entirely on private property. When it's subdivided, it'll all be gazetted. It will go into the gazette of BC Roads and no, no problem. Uh, Dukes Road, oh boy, those people own a whole bunch of our road, apparently. So there's about 30 of those. And you know, in truth, I counted that the roads that, that are up against the property line or appear to go into it, I counted over 160 and then I, I stopped looking. So I don't think that we're at much risk with those um, in terms of a Bettis Road dispute arising. What we're at risk with with that is that if you try to do any shoulder improvements, you're gonna get into purchases or expropriations. And MOTI will cover those now. Uh, municipality, of course, would have to cover them. Although, truth to tell, MOTI helps with some municipal expropriations. They're just not going to cover all the costs and not the legal costs and the delays and all that part. So, our taxes in brief. This is the one that I added. So, our basic road costs, if it's about $7,000 a kilometer, that's uh, number one. Provincial rural tax, the, and uh, I'll explain which also pays for stuff like Grace Islet. Um, the average $480,000 property, residential property, pays about $268 in the provincial rural tax. So if what Urban System says the roads will cost us five to 10 years out, uh, it's pretty equivalent, right? But if it's closer to the numbers that we can verify from MOTI, the municipal taxes are going to be more than the $268. And this is in constant $2016. That's the only thing we can work with. And that number on the municipal taxes, they say that uh, for every $100,000 in assessed value, there will be a $30.84 of tax put on that. So on a $480,000 property, that comes up to about $148. So that's where those numbers came from. If we're up to the cost that, uh, that Bowen pays for its roads, the taxes, municipal taxes, will be nearly $600 a year. Now let's say that you want to do the 1.1 million of rehab and replacement that was suggested in the incorporation study report. Well, you can see the real property tax in 2016 dollars stays at $268. But if the real cost of our roads is close to the Bowen's real cost of their roads, we're going to be up to $802 in a tax bill. But let's say that you want to do $2.2 million worth of rehab and replacement in a year. Well, those, this is how the numbers come out, and yet the real property tax stays the same. So it, it, the more road work that needs to be done, the more of a, a bargain the, the provincial rural tax is. What if there's a million dollars for emergency repairs? Well, you're going to add $148 on the average property tax bill, and two million in emergency repairs, just keep adding, you know, that's just how it goes up. So I, I've come to the end of my talk, and I guess the, the final thing, which I concluded with last night, and I'm still puzzling with it, and I guess I know the answer, is that if incorporation is such a great thing for Salt Spring, why couldn't, the, why couldn't they have been straight up about the road numbers? Why couldn't have we, why weren't we given the straight goods on what our roads are going to cost us? I, I just don't understand why, why we couldn't know that and, and why the numbers were, were kind of odd and missing and misleading and fudgy in the report. Is that necessary to get us incorporated? So I'll leave you with that. We, have, we can have some questions. Thank you. Thank you guys.